Well, hi, this is Warren Rushi, Extension Feedlot Specialist at South Dakota State University. And we're here at the Range Beef Cow Symposium in Rapid City, South Dakota. And joining me today is Dr. Brian Vanderlei with the Great Plains Veterinary Educational Center. And uh, we are talking, uh, your presentation today was on congestive heart failure in feedlot cattle. And, and when I heard this topic, I think I'm, I'm thinking myself and a lot of other people, they think congestive heart failure, they're going back to, you know, our, what we were taught is, you know, in undergrads or whatever about brisket disease and high altitude. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a problem, certainly not in the part of the world I came from in eastern South Dakota. Uh, but uh, you were kind of challenging those assumptions we have. So tell us a little bit more about why this is more of a, a widespread concern, perhaps, of what we would have otherwise thought. So there's a couple of things that we have found in our research that make it pretty concerning. Uh, we have done some genetic work that's some of what I presented today that shows that this the risk factors, which are not risk determinants, they don't create disease, they set cattle up to get the disease, but there's more to it. The problem is, is those risk factors are widespread. Uh, some of the, the, the breeds, particularly British breeds, Angus, Red Angus, have very high concentrations of those risk factors. And that means there's a lot of cattle that are at risk that put into a certain set of circumstances, which we've, we really don't know yet, can develop heart failure. And it's a, it's a terminal disease once they get it, they don't get over it. There's some salvage options, but they're they're far short of uh, the full market value of that animal. That was my next question. There really isn't a treatment option. No. This is a, so for producers that are experiencing this, what are some of the steps they should consider taking? Uh, what, if any, can they be doing? So the, this disease is a lot like some others where we have the, the setup for the disease can happen outside the ownership of the person who, or the operation who eventually experiences, uh, very, very similar to respiratory disease in cattle. The problem for feedlot producers that are experiencing heart failure in their cattle on feed is that by the time they get to that point, there's very little that can be done. We have no uh, really validated um, management strategies to help alleviate some, that, some of those problems. We do have people who have come to us with anecdotes, uh, ways that they think have, have helped them reduce the incidence of this particular problem. They're uncontrolled studies, sure. so we all know that variation from year to year is big, and uh, sometimes, sometimes it's real. I don't want to discount the the realness of some of those things, and sometimes uh, it's they, the year was different. In um, so one of the other things too that you know we talked about, and you know, and I've been you know you know in the feedlot circles, you'd hear about this in uh, you know tradition. I'd hear about it in places like you know Nebraska Panhandle, Scotts Bluff, the higher elevation, eastern slope of Colorado. But in your presentation, I've also heard it anecdotally that we're hearing it about this in lower elevation areas, southern Minnesota, eastern Nebraska, eastern South Dakota. So and and that's been tracking with what you've observed as well. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, that tells me a couple things. F to address the question first, yes, we see it places outside of where we see the biggest concentration of in Nebraska is in the, in the western part of the state, particularly in the Panhandle. Um, Nebraska is like a, a giant ramp. We go from about 4,500 feet in the far west of Nebraska all the way down to uh, probably in the 1,000, the 1,200 okay. foot range in the eastern part of the state. And it's, it's a pretty steady increase across so we've got lots of elevations and what we see that leads us to believe that we think oxygen or elevation is a risk factor that probably sums with the genetic risk or or contributes to the risk of disease is that the frequency increases as we go up that range. Okay. that being said we do see it at lower elevations uh, one of our collaborators dr greta crasher actually has worked at south mm -hmm. dakota state mm -hmm. university's diagnostic lab uh, she was there for a while and she had cases that she she told us about that we're actually in the practice area that, that the SDSU uh, Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab serves. And we have our own um, anecdotes of, the, I showed a picture today of a, a calf that was in a feedlot very close to where, where my office is in, in uh, kind of south central Nebraska. So, you know, and a lot of times this will you know, manifest itself as a, you know, as a sudden pen dead. But from just a, some visual things that you, sh visible things that you were showing in your presentation, what can people be looking for to say, this might be this rather than something like a digestive upset or, you know, some kind of other yep. pneumonia type issue? So there's a lot of clinical signs that are relatively consistent with a heart failure. The problem with heart failures is that there's a lot of ways to get heart failure. So hardware disease will cause heart failure in some cases. Chronic pneumonia will cause heart failure. 
the, con the signs of heart failure consistently are going to be edema in the brisket. So the one thing I, I even I, I've looked at a lot of these and I'll have trouble telling the difference between a finished steer that's really starting to accumulate yep. a, a lot of fat in its brisket and a, a sick animal. And there's a couple things to look for. Um, the jugular pulses is something that I mentioned in my presentation. Their jugular will fill with blood and actually the shock wave from the, the heart will be transferred through that blood up the neck and you can actually see that okay. jugular pulse happening. Pre, like antemortem, before they die, clinical signs are fairly valuable and fairly descriptive, but the pen dead is a real thing. And what I've noticed, again, anecdotes, um, where they happen commonly, the pen riders are really astute at picking them up early. And they'll be able to tell me, you know, that one over there, uh, we had one guy that was pretty good at predicting how long they would last. He said, that one's gonna last six weeks. Okay. You can have him in five <laughs> for your study. <laughs> In the, as we get into parts of the state where they're, they're less common, and I'm not sure if it's an observation thing or just the actual how the disease progresses, but they tend to be far more sudden. Okay. One of the biggest opportunities in livestock production in general is the necropsy. There's a lot of value in- I was just gonna say, that's where the value is, right? There's, it, it feels like throwing good money after bad. You've lost this animal, and if you spend more money trying to figure out why it died, when you already, sometimes there's really, you know, if you watch the lightning bolt hit it, the necropsy is probably <laughs> unnecessary. But in a lot of cases, there's nuance, there's, there's subtlety that can be picked up. And sometimes there's, there's whole new uh, potential causes of death and disease that get put on the table because the animal got opened up. And this is a great example of one of those. There's lots of ways to get heart failure. And really the only effective way to rule out some of those other causes are to get in there open up the heart, look around, and, and sometimes it even requires a microscopic okay. diagnosis, which is what a D-Lab is going to help with. So if we're thinking about this, you know, this, this syndrome that uh, is sometimes harder to predict, no treatment, um, what is then the longer term, what's your longer term vision of a potential solution for this uh, you know, so that it becomes less of an issue down the road? Mm -hmm. The, the fundamental solution for this and the one that we are most focused on is the genetic solution. So we are, we actually are more than confident it's genetic and in, okay. in, not in origin, but in risk. The, the initial risk is a genetic one. We have identified a couple of those risk factors. Uh, we use a genome scan platform to do that. And we are getting to the point of doing whole genome sequencing. So we're looking at every SNP in that, those animals genomes to find out where the risk is coming from. That, that's coming, stay tuned. But what we've already found is two very significant risk factors that seem to be contributing to a lot of the cases that we see. And the fundamental solution for genetic risk is to breed it out of the population. The problem with that in cattle production, we have long generation intervals, we have uh, very stable, long-lived populations of, of maternal cows. So that's a long-term solution. And, and at the same time, some of those genetic solutions are might be in somewhat of a conflict with some of the market signals we're getting in terms of genetic choices. So yeah. that's going to be a it's going to be a complex uh, it, solution it, to this problem. It will be complex. The good thing at this point is that we don't have any indications that this is going to be tied to some of the other things that are very important to us. Uh, the I reserve the right to be wrong about how we've interpreted the data we've collected so far, but at this point we're we're becoming increasingly confident that we will not have to choose between productivity of animals and health. And that is a very important choice not and, to, to put producers in. And there. that was one of the initial concerns was that mm -hmm. we've selected for growth and now we've created this other problem. Yep. And what you've found is they aren't necessarily linked, that there's some genetic components, but we can find, we can still find those cattle that have the, ge the growth genetics and the carcass genetics we need. Yes. We just need to eliminate some of those genes that are causing these other issues. Exactly. And we're pretty optimistic that that is possible. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vanderlei, and uh, we're here again from uh, Range Beef Cow Symposium. Uh, thank you all for listening.